Welcome to Commodore Technologies. That's a lot like Commodore, but with a Q instead of a C, so it's completely different. I'm Scott Robison, and this is Behind the Scenes of Petsky Robots for the Commodore 128. In August, the 8-Bit Guy published the Petsky Robots Part 4 video, which announced the Atari port of the game and gave an update on the Commander X16 version. At the end of the video, he shared a list of platforms that he'd probably like to see get a port of Petsky Robots, including the Commodore Plus 4, the BBC Micro, and several Nintendo and Atari consoles. I couldn't believe he didn't include the Commodore 128 in his list. If ever there was an A-bit computer that deserved, demanded a port, in my opinion, it had to be the Commodore 128. I reached out to David to see if there was any interest in my idea to create a simple port of the Commodore 64 version that would work on the 128's 80-column screen. In my mind, this would be a straightforward task that could take advantage of the faster 2 MHz mode of the CPU, and since the 80-column video display controller, or VDC, allows up to 512 characters on screen at one time, we could have higher resolution tiles than the C64 version. As we discussed the idea over several days, he got really excited at some of the possibilities. The 128 has twice as much RAM as the 64, so perhaps we could include features that he had to omit from previous versions. We could utilize both monitors that are supported by the 128 at the same time, and if speed wasn't an issue, we'd be able to utilize the VIC chip's multicolor bitmap graphics mode instead of being limited to redefined character graphics. These ideas would require a bit more effort than my original idea, but it was exciting and I wanted to give it a shot. As David has explained in his videos, most ports of the game have started with the PET version of the source code. For the 128, we started from the C64 version. This made the most sense as the two computers shared compatible hardware, including the VIC video chip and the SID sound chip. When I first received the source code from David, I started trying my original idea of targeting the simple 80 column version, while he and I continued talking over some of the other possibilities. There were pros and cons to my initial approach. One benefit would be that the 80 column screen supports 512 simultaneous characters that can be used all at the same time. The 64 was limited to 256 characters at once. Tiles on the 64 were 3x3 three three characters, or 24x24 24 24 pixels. Using 80 column mode would allow us to have 6x3 character tiles, or 48x24 pixels, providing twice the horizontal resolution. Additionally, the 80 column screen works in 2 MHz mode, unlike the 40 column screen, so we could do more work per frame. Unfortunately, there are also drawbacks. The VDC is very slow to access. The VIC chip shares memory with the CPU, so it is trivial for the CPU to update screen memory in 40 column mode. The VDC has its own private block of memory that the CPU cannot access directly. Instead, the computer must ask the video chip to please update the memory, and this takes a lot longer per byte. This is why the VDC is visibly slower most of the time. It's not bad for text-only purposes, but trying to frequently update video memory in 80 column mode for a video game is a lot more difficult. In addition to the fact that each byte written to the 80 column screen takes longer than a byte on the 40 column screen, we have to write twice as many bytes for every screen. Another complication of the 80 column mode is that there is no sprite support. On the VIC, to display a sprite, you have a pattern in memory, and then you set a byte that says, sprite, display this pattern. One byte, very fast, and you get a whole new image. Because the VDC does not have sprites, we would have to create fake sprites with redefined characters, and each sprite would wind up requiring 36 bytes of data over what is a slow video chip interface. I worked on this idea for about a week, it just gave me an opportunity to learn how the code worked, while David and I hammered out the ideas for his vision for the game. While I think I could have made it work eventually, 
I have to admit that his vision for a 128 port of the game was more compelling than what I was already doing. I may revisit a VDC version down the road, but I gave up on that so that we could start this game. By early to mid-September, we had hammered out what we wanted to do. We wanted to have both displays in use at the same time to provide a feature that hadn't been available on any previous version. We would start by porting the 64 version to work within the slightly different memory map of the 128, and we would add support for the second screen to display a map of the current level. At first, we thought we would have to use Monochrome Map for the second screen so that it would work on the original 128 that only included 16K of video RAM. This is because a 640 by 200 bitmap takes 16K of memory without any color information. I discovered that we could reprogram the VDC to use a smaller screen resolution of only 512 by 128 pixels. That only required 8K, or half of the available memory, which left enough available that we were able to allocate some for color data. The VDC supports variable size attributes for color cells, uh, going all the way down to 8x2, which provides two unique colors per color cell. By treating the left half as one color and the right half as another color, the 512 by 128 screen could support a virtual size of 128 by 64, which is the exact size of the maps. And every chunky pixel on the screen could be any of the supported 16 colors, each representing a different tile. By drawing the map at the beginning of a level and only updating a few pixels per frame, we were able to keep the overhead low so that it didn't negatively impact the speed. Once that was working well, we saved that version of the game so that we'd have something unique for the 128 just in case we failed to achieve our next objective, switching the game from redefined characters to multicolor bitmap mode. As David has explained in his videos, each game tile on the 64 takes 18 bytes, half for the characters and half for the colors. As there are 256 possible tiles, that means the tile data for the 64 took 4.5K of RAM. Multicolor bitmap graphics are quite a bit larger and would require five times the data. Each multicolor bitmap tile takes 72 bytes of bitmap data and an additional 18 bytes of color data for a total of 90 bytes per tile or 22.5K of RAM for all of the tiles. In addition to the space it would take, we had to question whether or not we could really do it quickly enough. Most games that use bitmap mode on the 64 use it as a static, unchanging, or minimally changing background image because it takes so long to create a bitmap screen when you are running on a 1 megahertz CPU. We were proposing drawing a huge portion of the screen every frame, so it needed to, you know, we needed to make it as fast as possible. Normally, it would take at least 110 milliseconds, or about 10 frames per second, to draw a full bitmap screen because that's how long it takes to read and write 10,000 bytes of data from one 16-bit address to another 16-bit address. The 6502 CPU and derivatives can copy data faster from zero page to the stack. It could copy the same 10,000 bytes in only 70 milliseconds, about 36% faster, if all the graphics were in zero page and all of the screen memory was in the stack. When you're copying that much data, every little bit helps. The problem is that zero page and the stack only have 256 bytes each, far short of the 10,000 bytes we need to be able to address. Fortunately, the 128 memory management unit allows you to move the location of zero page and the stack to any page in memory. I was able to organize the tile graphics very carefully so that there were three tiles per page over 86 pages of memory in RAM block zero, which is the first 64K of RAM. The bitmap display was stored in RAM block one, the second 64, so I pointed the stack to that area of memory. 
I would then copy the 90 bytes from one page and push it on the bitmap stack. Then when I was done, I would move zero page in the stack back to their normal default location. There is a bit of overhead involved in this process, so we didn't realize the full 36% speed improvement, but the new tile routine was 25-30% to 30 faster than it would have been using normal 6502 techniques. The other thing we did was to borrow a trick from the Apple II version of the game. We keep track of what tiles we've drawn on what parts of the screen, and then when we're drawing tiles for screen updates, we check to see what did we last draw. If it's the same, that means that nothing has changed and there's no need to copy it again, and that was an even bigger win for us. In many ways, the 128 port was probably the easiest port. Uh, there was no need for me to worry about music and sound because we already had that from the Commodore 64 version, and it uses the exact same SID chip at the exact same addresses. So I didn't have to do anything new for that. Most of the game logic is completely unchanged. The challenging portions, as we've already talked about, are the VDC map in a limited 16K space while using color, and also getting the multicolor graphics to copy fast enough. We knew about those problems up front, so we had plans to address them. Uh, thus, they were never really a huge obstacle for us. They just took time. There were a couple of problems that I did encounter uh, fairly late in the development process. In the last week or two, I had a few days where I made a lot of typos. And these weren't just any ordinary typos where I happened to hit the wrong key, but in a random way. For some reason, I kept substituting the number 6 for the number 7, and the number 7 for the number 6. It's almost like I developed numeric dyslexia or something. Um, because I'm doing this game in my spare time around my full-time job, I didn't always test the code as carefully as I should have, so David had to keep telling me about this mistake or that error and this was wrong and that could be done differently. Uh, all of the problems were easily fixed once I saw the 6 versus 7 problem, but I was a little embarrassed that I had delivered these bugs to David in you know that condition. But in the end, it was more embarrassing than harmful. The other obstacle I didn't think much about up front was getting the timing right on both NTSC hardware used in North America and PAL hardware used in much of the rest of the world. One of the testers with a PAL machine observed that the timing of the game was all wrong, the music was too slow, events weren't happening when they should, and, and so on. This is because NTSC machines run at 60 cycles per second and PAL runs at 50 cycles per second. The 17% difference was very noticeable. David suggested that I should switch from using the raster interrupt, which is the default that the 128 uses for tracking timing of events, uh, to one of the timer interrupts that are available in the system on a different chip. Because the game doesn't use a serial modem or other RS-232 hardware, I decided to use one of the timers normally reserved for that. This way, I could set a timeout that was good for either type of system, at which point a non-maskable interrupt would occur. We could do our interrupt-driven code at that point and then continue. It was easy to add, and the code would load successfully, and I could go to the intro screen, I could navigate up and down the menu, I could change the keyboard mapping, I could pick a level, um, I could change the difficulty level, but as soon as I would start a game, it would hang after drawing just a few tiles on screen. It didn't make sense to me for an hour or two until I finally realized my stupid mistake. The tile drawing code moves zero page and the stack around in memory. If a non-maskable interrupt happens, when the stack is moved to the bitmap display, the CPU will push information onto the stack, which is not really the stack anymore. That had the potential to corrupt the screen a little bit, but that's not the worst part. The other problem is that when an interrupt happens, the computer changes the memory map. It replaces RAM with ROM and I.O. memory. Any data we push onto the stack risks corrupting I.O. space, which could crash the system conceivably. But what's more, 
information that's pushed onto the stack where there is ROM will be written to the RAM under the ROM. But pulling it back off the stack later reads the data from the ROM, not the underlying RAM, which is virtually guaranteed to be the wrong thing, and the return address will take you to the wrong part of memory, and all sorts of bad things happen like locking up your game. I hadn't had this issue previously because at first I was using maskable interrupts, not the non-maskable variety. And the tile code instructed the computer to disable maskable interrupts until I was done drawing a tile. Once I realized this, the fix was simple. I just had to use a different timer that would be cooperative with disabled interrupts. But it was confusing for a few hours trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. As is the case with many programmers, I was drawn to computers when I was a kid because I liked video games. I even worked for a couple of game companies, uh, Acclaim and Access, in the mid to late 90s. Even though I haven't been a full-time game programmer for over 20 years, I still enjoy the challenge. Being able to work with the 8-bit guy on Petsky Robots for the Commodore 128 has been a great experience. I'm sure that he could have done it all on his own if he'd been so inclined, but it was awesome to work with him on his vision for this port. Now that he and I are best friends, I'm sure he's eagerly looking forward to the opportunity to collaborate again in the future, just as I am. Uh, his lawyer wanted me to throw in something here about that not being true, but just pretend that it really is true. Anyway, thank you, David, for giving me a shot at the game, and thanks to all of you for watching this video. I've done other videos on my personal channel, Casa de Robison, in the past, but other than a few progress videos for 128 Robots, this is my first video on this channel. I hope you've enjoyed it, and please be sure to let me know in the comments what you think. If you can be nice when doing so, that would be even better, but I'll take whatever feedback I can get. Anyway, thank you again, and take care until next time.